welcome. My name is Lynn Nygaard. I'm the director of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture. And we're delighted to welcome Dr. Tara White to the CNBC and to Emory today. Dr. White is an assistant professor, research professor in the Department of Behavioral and Social Sciences in the Center for Alcohol and Addiction Studies in the School of Public Health at Brown University. She's the founding director of the Laboratory of Effective Neuroscience in, at Brown University. She's also core faculty in many things <laughs> or an affiliated faculty across many institutes, but including the Brown University Contemplative Studies Program and affiliated faculty with the Watson Institute Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies. Dr. White received her PhD in developmental psychology at Cornell University and completed postdoctoral training in cognitive and behavioral neuroscience at Cornell, and then um, a second postdoctoral position in psychopharmacology at the University of Chicago. Among her many awards and honors, Dr. White is a fellow of the Association for Psychological Sciences and a life fellow at the University of Cambridge. Dr. White's research focuses on a variety of things, but including the neurobiology, biological mechanisms of human emotion and drug effects. Her work is multidisciplinary and uses a variety of neuroimaging and behavioral techniques to study the neural mechanisms of emotion, cognition, and behavior in humans. Her work addresses two fundamental areas, and I mention this because she'll She's going to be talking about the extension of this work um, to um, dignity neuroscience, but She's been interested in the basic neuroscience of emotion and drug and alcohol effects in the human brain. And so she's recently applied her expertise in neural correlates of human behavior to address the foundations of human dignity, bringing a neuroscience lens to the origins of universal rights in the human brain. So please join me in welcoming Dr. White. She'll be talking today on dignity neuroscience connected action. Thank you so much. I'm just so pleased to be here in community, in person um, with all of you. It, this is actually my first in-person talk since the beginning of the pandemic. So for me, it's, it's, it's emotional. Yeah, it's emotional to be able to be here and, and talking with people without a screen between us. But, um, and in these talks, I know that we've got, you know, multiple ways to be a part of an audience. And so I'm, I'm really high, highly cognizant of the fact that we've got lots of folks that are here um, on Zoom and gonna be watching asynchronously too. So I consider you very much to be minds in the room as well. So um, with that said, um, I'm talking today about sort of a new initiative that I'm hoping to seed both at Brown um, and elsewhere uh, that I'm calling Dignity Neuroscience. So I'm going to go through a couple of, um, I've got like a three point structure here. So I'm going to talk initially about the human rights framework in terms of international law um, that's existing today. Um, the dignity and neuroscience framework um, for supporting human dignity and universal rights. And um, maybe I start to start a conversation about potential applications and collaborations going forward. So it's, Fairly unusual to be talking about human rights, neuroscience, and flourishing all in one talk. Um, and so that's sort of our, uh, the scope of what we're hoping to, you know, touch on today as a group. So the human rights framework was basically um, established by the United Nations in uh, coordination with um, leadership um, internationally to try to address the major problems following World War II. So at that point, the issue was how to really protect individuals um, from a adverse action from their own governments and from other governments. So a lot of this work was pitched at the level of nation states and the ways to protect individual citizens from um, the bad actions of, of, at the state level. So there's a number of foundational documents um, that are supporting the universal human rights um, internationally. And they include the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, which was the very, uh, the first and, and most important foundational document um, released by the United Nations. It was followed on by a, a number of, and, and there's, there are many actually um, treaties and covenants that are relevant here, but. I picked out just several. So there's two in 1966, 
um, one about political rights and um, another about social, cultural, and economic rights. So these are actually freely available online. And I, I linked to them in our paper on this because, I, and they're worth a read, particularly for an American audience, because I think there's some ideas in here that um, while the United States has signed off on it on the international stage, um, they're often sort of neglected um, for our own citizenship here, which is and makes for interesting reading as an American citizen. So what's really interesting is that while we have a very um, cogent and carefully constructed set of, of rules really about um, universal human rights and their protections at the international level, um, these have, um, in terms of the intellectual infrastructure supporting that entire enterprise, it's based in two things in current um, construction and articulation in our international law. Um, so each of these um, treaties and covenants is very specific about the rationale and basis for universal rights. And it's very specifically based in the concept of intrinsic human dignity. I mean, that's, that's a profoundly important concept. Um, and it's also defined, defined by a process of mutual agreement, of course, right? These are nation states that have come together to decide on sort of international norms that are mutually agreeable. So the issue uh, uh, by my reading is that when you have an entire body of work that's founded in a concept as important as intrinsic human dignity, the problem is, is that in these, in these um, documents, it's actually not defined. And it's not defined anywhere. <laughs> and it's actually, uh, and, and you should, I really recommend that you read them. It's referred to almost parenthetically, grounded and based in intrinsic human dignity of the individual human person. And then it just goes on. Like it's not defined, it's not described. There's, there's literally no description or definition of what dignity entails. So as a grounding and principle that undergirds the entire um, enterprise, as a scientist, that, that worries me that this is, you know, while informed by many cultural, religious, and philosophical traditions, is actually left largely without discussion. As a result, um, and as a result of the sort of collaborative international efforts in this area, these rights, these universal rights, have been defined by sort of mutual agreement which is wonderful, that's very important. Um, but the issue there is that anything that's defined almost exclusively by mutual agreement can be um, disinterred by um, disagreement and people sort of volitionally and nation states ignoring those, those previous agreements. So there's basically, an, um, this. I was had the good, good fortune of attending um, a conference on international rights um, by the British Academy in 2018 when I was at the University of Cambridge for the first time. Um, and during the, that discussion with all of these leaders in the field, it really became clear to me that the intellectual infrastructure supporting the concept of universal human rights could use some attention. So I'm gonna go through a few source documents here. This is actually, I love that it's in half in English and half in French. Um, but you can see this is the, the original source document from 1948, right after World War II. Um, and you can see that in the preamble, it's absolutely the grounding of, of these constructs in the concept of inherent dignity of, of the individual. So by my reading and by my understanding of um, the current construction of universal rights in international law, um, that these rights, and they're in many documents, and these documents are very long, um, basically have an underlying um, structure. That structure in, entails five domains and a modifier. And these domains include agency, autonomy, and self-determination, um, the rights to freedom from want and privation, which is severe poverty, freedom from fear or maltreatment, uh, 
the rights and reality of human uniqueness and the unconditionality of these rights. With, so there's the five domains and then the modifier is, um, there's a lot of attention in these documents given to specific um, cases where extra protect, protections are necessary. So these are, for instance, for um, adolescents, um, individuals, uh, imprisoned individuals and folks sort of under control of states. So places where these rights um, are vulnerable to abuse. So there's many specific um, special protections. So my graduate student, Meg Gonsalves and I, um, last year wrote a paper addressing and trying to really bolster this entire infrastructure for universal rights using the tools and the knowledge um, of human neuroscience. So I, this is the QR code. So if you'd like, you can pull it up sort of in real time here. So I'm gonna go through the five domains and um, really discuss how they're articulated in existing international documents and how they relate to the brain. So in each domain, I'm just pulling like one exemplar. So this is sort of as Americans, I think we resonate with this one, you know, that everyone has the right to life, liberty and security of person. The liberty is clearly in the agency domain. And in the, in the article we've um, outlined in table one, um, multiple of these um, treaties and covenants. So this is the 1948 um, covenant. This is the one on civil and political rights, economic, social, and cultural rights. And then there's also the UN goals for um, the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs of the United Nations. And as you can see, there's um, multiple points where in each of these, life and liberty, security of person, freedom of movement, so the ability to move across state lines at will, um, freedom of thought, free choice of employment, the rights to self-determination, rights to liberty, ability to hold opinions without interference. Um, and then again, in the preambles, that the ideal of free human beings is driving a driving and grounding force for the work and to be respecting the freedom. Um, I, I love that science is in here. <laughs> so um, really the freedom required to do good work in, in difficult areas. In, in the domain of freedom from want, um, so here's an exemplar. So everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well being of himself and his family. So, right in there, that really what you, that protection from severe deprivation is considered a universal human right. Um, so, again, you see this in the preamble, sort of grounding the entire discussion. Um, very specifically here in the 1948 um, declaration. And so there's implications for social security, social net programs at the national and local levels. And that um, also processes that are important for maintaining your ability to you know, provide for your family and to have a good quality of life, such as education fall under this, this category. Um, also the ability to be free from hunger, And as far as being able to achieve the highest possible standard of physical and mental health, you know, as an American reading this, that's, that's very interesting that that is in the Universal Declaration. That, that is not something that Americans typically would think of as a universal human right, just based on cultural um, ideas. And again, here, the implications that medical care and medical access would constitute a core part of freedom from um, want and destitution because it directly speaks to your ability to provide for and have a, a good quality of life. Freedom from fear, we're starting to get into sort of the dark side of um, human rights violations. Um, these issues really deal with um, protection from maltreatment and abuse and the absolute importance of bodily security. And freedom of fear is not my term. <laughs> um, there's a speech by FDR uh, very early on that specifically articulates this as one of the important freedoms. Um, and it is involved, it stated explicitly in the 1966 declarations as being an important 
construct. So examples here, again, freedom from fear is specifically called out in multiple covenants, um, bodily security of person. These, of course, are gonna be um, protecting right to life, um, freedom from torture, um, and any propaganda for war shall be prohibited by law, which is interesting given the current um, events in Ukraine. And then, of course, uh, actions that would protect you from bodily harm. So these include um, the rights to asylum across borders. And, and it really brings in the international um, community in protecting these universal rights. So these rights extend beyond borders. And also these are some of the modifiers here so that any issue that would um, put someone in a fear um, place um, are also considered um, prohibited and, and um, worthy of special attention. Now we're getting into some of the more positive sides. Um, I'm gonna talk about the domain of uniqueness. Now I find as a personality psychologist and someone in effective science, I, I actually love the fact that the word personality is in this document <laughs> and specifically linked to dignity such that the development of each of our unique capabilities and strengths is seen as a, a component of inherent dignity. This is a really interesting idea. Here's some, as you can see, uniqueness is a little bit less well represented in these documents, at least the five to six that I'm um, spanning. But you can see here that the uniqueness of each human individual person drives the need for economic, social, and cultural rights and access. And again, here, every person has the right to protection of um, interests that are coming out of these special efforts that flow from their uniqueness. So again, this is a little bit of science and, and humanities here, protections. And again, processes that allow uniqueness to flourish over development, so special education um, is very much supported in these documents. And the last, one of the last areas we're gonna talk about is unconditionality. And I think that it's really important to pay attention to the language here. So these are, these universal rights are absolutely unconditional. There is no sliding scale of rights. Um, and you can see it in the language, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Again, inherent dignity. This cannot be taken away. This is not conditional on any aspect of the individual person or their circumstance. So again, in the preamble, motivating the entire um, project. And here we see the, the language, all human beings are born free and equal. Everyone has a right to a nationality. Everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which rights and freedoms are respected. So equality, universality, and that these rights will be protected without discrimination of any sort. So I think it's really, really critical. And for me personally, while I was in this conference really sort of bombarded by all the acronyms and special expert language of the folks in the field, um, it was this moment where they were talking about the plight of the stateless. And I thought, you know, I, I wasn't working in this area at that time. And I thought, this just seems like such an opaque legal point. Like, why does it matter that someone has a right to a nationality? And then it occurred to me, stateless people, they, no one has their back. They're not a legal entity. They're not a protectable legal entity in any nation. They fall through every crack in our societies. And so, it, it was literally at that point that this entire um, structure of human rights came to me because I realized that here, right here, talking about the most vulnerable person per people in any circumstance would be the stateless. And that really, a stateless person, it really speaks to the need for unconditional belonging in a society. And everything we know as psychologists and neuroscientists speak to the importance of unconditional belonging for human flourishing. So this is the human rights um, framework in terms of its inherent structure. So uh, these legal 
international documents really fall into these five domains with the modifier that there need to be special protections um, outlined for special circumstances when people are particularly vulnerable. So in terms of talking about the modifier, there's a lot of neuroscience evidence um, that plasticity is important both in development and in adulthood. And you can see that these, um, these documents actually articulate quite a few different special circumstances in which um, these protections can be at higher risk. And so therefore they need to be, um, have special protections in place. So these would be um, risky periods such as um, motherhood and childbirth. Um, also um, children and young people who are still developing organisms. Um, of course, the family, which is protecting um, young children. And then again, that uh, the universality of the importance um, that every child without discrimination um, should have these rights. There's, in these documents, there's also quite a bit of attention paid to the special uh, case of prisoners and um, conditions where states have stepped in and removed autonomy from individuals. So um, that prisoners are a protected population and especially juvenile um, prisoners. So that's a sort of an intersection of risk there in terms of this is a still a developing um, person who is now in control of the, in, being controlled by the state through um, just briefly some of the neuroscience um, findings that support these five domains and the protections um, at the international level. So in the agency, the domain of agency, so agency is basically your ability to make um, independent choices and action in the world. Um, we have a lot of information about the neurobiology that supports that ability. Um, from effective neuroscience. So we have a lot of information about states that are agentic and traits that are agentic. So things like agentic extroversion is really about making and taking independent um, choices and um, implementing them. So what we know from state and trait um, agency studies is that there's a large involvement and contribution of um, dopamine circuits that or originating in the tegmentum. So these are um, originating in the ventral tegmental area. And then these are sort of beautiful ascending circuits that are um, coming from some of the deepest parts of the brain and then um, coursing through, especially frontal regions and hitting areas that are involved like the nucleus accumbens and ventral striatum, um, which are basically where you're transforming and transmuting motivation into action. So these circuits are really supporting individual choices and action in the world based on the desires of the individual. Uh, autonomy is also, a, there's a large body of work done um, using yoke control study designs in humans that really have looked hard at what um, states are necessary and important for learning. And you know, human beings are learning machines and we are learning machines through our entire lives. So this is a, a key, key function of, of the central nervous system. And, and it's been found in these um, yoke control studies where there's one condition where the person is fully autonomous. And as a result, the um, sequela from their actions are fully contingent. So the, their actions have meaning. Whereas a yoked control, all the, they're experiencing all the same things that the person in the autonomous condition does, but it's proscribed based on the prior, the other person's experience. So for people in the control condition, there is no connection between their action and the consequences that they receive. So they basically are receiving the consequences of someone else's actions. And it's the exact same train of stimuli and events. So this has been used as a, as a tool for learning about what is the importance of autonomy for learning almost anything. It's been used for things as simple as um, some athletic skills um, to things as complicated as can you do 
control some of these. Um, uh, so like biofeedback protocols, um, there's attentional control studies, some cognitive learning. I mean, it's, it's an astounding array of, of domains in which um, this you know, question has been asked. And in each of those domains, it's very clear that autonomy is absolutely critical for human learning. So it really transcends domains. And we've got a long list <laughs> and a very long list of references um, that really support that. And I think it just really speaks to the absolute criti criticality of agency and autonomy for um, the flourishing of the human individual. Um, we also get some information um, about the neurobiology of agency from um, conditions where uh, self-determination has been hijacked by drugs um, with abuse potential. So this includes alcohol, so alcohol use disorder and substance use disorder. So in these um, conditions, basically this circuitry that transmutes motivation to action gets hijacked by the supernormal effects of drugs on these systems. And what you see is you see a dysregulation of both dopamine um, release and sensitivity and also um, compounds that are particularly important for learning like glutamatergic compounds. So these are compounds that are involved in excitatory neurotransmission. The, the timing and reactivity of those circuits gets um, dysregulated in ventral striatum and also in um, dorsal striatum. So onto our, our second area of privation. So this is um, addressing the universal right to um, freedom from want. There's a very large literature in humans about the impact of poverty and discrimination on the brain, both um, function and structure and development. And what we're seeing is that in children, um, the effects of poverty are really um, quite adverse and they're impacting multiple brain areas um, and that severe poverty impacts the volume of areas as important as the amygdala, the hippocampus and the anterior cingulate. These are areas involved in emotional processing and perception, learning and memory. And the anterior cingulate is a hub region in multiple networks involved in salience, attention and behavioral control. So these are absolutely critical circuits and, and poverty is hitting these circuits in a fundamental way. Um, poverty has also been related to reductions in cortical surface volume in a, a wide variety of areas. So this includes the superior frontal cortex, which is involved in executive function, the precuneus, which is also involved in multiple cognitive processes and the, the cingulate, as well as the insula, and the inferior temporal cortex. Discrimination um, looks like it's impacting a subset of these regions that are affected by poverty. So it's impacting um, reactivity at rest in the amygdala, which is absolutely critical for emotional processing and salience attribution. And it's impacting uh, the connectivity between the amygdala, the insula, and the anterior cingulate. The insula is processing um, internal signals. So this is, it's speaking to um, and mitigating or not the effects of stress on the body. So it's really, there's a large body of work that's really indicating that poverty and discrimination becomes embodied in the brain and that it is obviously harmful. Okay, with regards to maltreatment, this is a difficult literature to read. Um, it really is dealing with issues of bodily safety in multiple populations. Um, I have to give a lot of credit to my student, Meg, who really did a lot of the heavy lifting in this area because this area is hard for me to read. Um, this is about the freedom um, from fear and the absolute right to bodily integrity at every age. So here there's a, a huge body of work done in children um, specifically childhood maltreatment. This list is uh, you know, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse in kids is related to systematic changes in frontal regions, specifically the ventral lateral 
orbital frontal cortex, which is involved in reward processing and updating, um, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which is involved in executive function, the temporal pole, which um, is linked with multiple affective processes, the amygdala and the hippocampus. So it's really impacting brain regions that are absolutely critical for emotional processing, emotional control, and um, executive function. In terms of in adulthood, um, the best data we have is from um, intimate par partner violence, especially in women. That's much higher in women than it is in men. Um, and uh, exposure to war, both as combatants, observers, and um, folks who are just sort of caught in the crossfire. Um, with regard to inter intimate partner violence, you see that these impacts ratchet back into the brain, so you get more involvement of the cingulate and the middle temporal gyrus in the hippocampus. In folks who have lived with intimate partner violence, um, you're seeing changes in emotional processing, um, changes in the ability to plan, and changes in learning and memory that can affect the memory for the abuse. In terms of exposure to war, it's very, very clear that um, amongst combat veterans, specifically those from the Afghanistan and Iraqi um, conflicts, that they, after exposure to combat, they're coming back with hyperactivation in noradrenergic circuits. These are absolutely critical systems in terms of how one processes all kinds of aversive stimuli. So um, noradrenergic uh, ascending circuitry has been implicated in processes as important as uncertainty, anxiety, distress, and fear. Um, and these circuits become hyperactive. Um, there's multiple readouts for that. It's extremely clear that this is happening and as a result of the direct exposure to war amongst combatants. Um, combat uh, veterans also have come home from Afghanistan and Iraqi um, theaters with what they call the signature injury, which is, involves both concussion and traumatic a mild traumatic brain injury. Um, that is related to um, changes in white matter throughout the brain. Um, so they get um, basically white matter deficits and they also get a hyper um, activation of working memory circuitry. So as a result, it's very hard. Those kind of flashback PTSD experiences are literally etched into the brain with the hyperactivity of these circuits and the reverberation of working memory as a result. So there's also, um, upsettingly, a very um, robust literature about the impact of war on non-combatants. This includes um, women who are pregnant in war zones, um, for whom there's a, some really um, sobering data about methylation of important neural growth factors in the placenta. So this includes things like um, BDNF, which is brain-derived neural growth factor, which is really critical in terms of the wiring of um, the central nervous system in the fetus. Women in war zones have these um, methylations of BDNF in the placenta, thereby affecting the development of their fetus. And the thing about methylation is that there's some evidence in humans that it can be intergenerationally transmitted which means that um, being pregnant in a war zone could potentially impact multiple generations in these families. Back to things that are more fun. <laughs> um, in terms of the uniqueness of the human person, this is actually um, supported by a multitude of neural processes, which I refer to as brain individuation. So there's fun fact, how similar are you genetically to other people on the planet? It turns out that the math behind genetic uniqueness in humans is actually quite profound. So it turns out that each of us, born with our specific complement of genes, the likelihood that we, each of us in this room, was born with the exact uh, 
complement of genes that we have is something like one in 10 raised to the 11,847th power. This is an infinitesimally small number. So it's just basically unlikely that any of us would have been born genetically who we are. So that's where we begin, right? That's where we start. That's how unique we start. After that, pretty much everything about neural development over time not only supports that individuality, but it amplifies it over time. And these are involved by um, processes of neural, noisy neural development. So this happens at every level. It's synaptic wiring, the formation of dendritic, dendritic trees, the ways that axons course from their initial cell bodies to their final target. All of this is stochastic. So for instance, axons get to where they need to go by these neural growth, um, growth hormone leading edge and this sort of in a paracrine function, but there's a lot of variability there. So it's not deterministic. If we were to rerun the developmental you know, experiment that is each of our lives, we would be different because of this no noisy process. This is an intrinsically, um, there's intrinsic randomness in the way that we wire up. And this happens at every level. It happens within synapses and it happens between brain regions. So there's just sort of the fundamental nuts and bolts of how the nervous system grows itself up. This, so, you know, my background in developmental psychology is really relevant here because non-shared environment is sort of the misunderstood sort of stepchild of developmental psychology. Like, why should shared environment not explain very much? So non-shared environment is actually defined as the things that children raised in the same family experience that make them different. So these are not, this is not the things that they share that are the same. It's not having the same parents. It's not having the same social class, like all the things you would think would make kids the same in one family. Turns out that those things actually have very little impact, at least once you've already got sort of the basics of education and nutrition and bodily safety in place in families that are, you know, middle class who participate in twin studies, it turns out that it's, it's the unique things that matter. It's the things that make kids different that actually explains the most of the variance in emotional traits. So on top of that, we've got multiple processes that facilitate um, mosaicism between um, neurons within the brain. So these are things like DNA methylation, histone acetylation, um, rant, just mutations, um, copy number variation. And these things allow genetic, you know, from each of us genetically identical at birth, your neurons are expressing different things and they acquire these individual characteristics over development. So even at the cellular level, you are a mosaic that's even inside yourself. On top of that is the last process, which is the modularity of gene expression in the brain, which is really interesting. So even though, so we start out with variation, that variation gets acted on by random forces across development. It also gets acted on by our unique experiences. And then on top of it, the expression of all of that difference happens in a very patchy fashion. It happens in a patchy fashion across regions. And there's known gradients from posterior to anterior in variation and expression of genes across the brain. And then it also varies over time. So you can get overexpression or underexpression of genes that differs in different brain areas as a function of time over development. So you take all of that, it's it's an amazing and very powerful amplification of the initial individuality that we come into the world with. I think it's actually quite profound. The last area um, in terms of the five domains is unconditionality, which is really about unconditional belonging and the universal human need for unconditional belonging. So here we have a lot of data from um, both in both children and adults that affiliative processes um, 
bonding and attachment can be related to specific um, neural circuits. In kids, you see that kids with um, secure attachment um, in childhood are, you find greater activity in reward related circuits. Um, so that's um, pretty profound. Um, one of my favorite studies in this area was LeBlanc 2017 and the, um, sorry, Frontiers in Psychology, where they took a look at securely attached infants at 15 months of age, and then waited 10 years and took a look at the gray matter volumes across the brain um, at age 10, and they're finding hits in all of these regions. There's also a growing um, and important literature in, in human couples that's talking about secure attachment and bonding in adulthood. And that's been um, found to relate to processes in the medial orbital frontal cortex and in opiate sensitivity. So you can see that we, that this um, need for unconditional belonging is really embodied in multiple circuits. And the last topic of, of protections for vulnerable populations uh, relates specifically to the plasticity of the human brain across time. Um, again, just like uniqueness, this is supported by multiple processes at literally every level of the central nervous system. From the level at the molecular level, where you've got multiple homeostatic processes that are maintaining you know, the stores of neurotransmitters required for function and also for tissue maintenance, that learning and memory really are embodied in ensembles of cells. Um, learning is literally encoded in the, those communities of cells and also how those cells are updated over time and supported, strangely, learning is supported over time by a dynamic process of plasticity called basal dynamics. So plasticity itself actually helps you to maintain memories over time, despite the fact that you can have all kinds of, you know, tissue changes, physiological changes. Um, the fact that uh, we have the maintenance of memory over time is due to this process, which happens throughout the brain. In um, humans, there's some beautiful work done um, based on C14 differences in the atmosphere that is, are then up, up taken um, by newly formed neurons. And it turns out that we have a fairly, um, there's very interesting data that indicate that there is ongoing neurogenesis, this is the birth of new neurons in humans in areas of the brain that are pretty important for um, agency and um, cognition. So these are impacting um, areas in the striatum and also in the hippocampus. And that's different from other species. Um, so your potential adult neurogenesis in striatum it appears to be unique to humans and it's not found in um, other species like rodents. So in terms of where we go from here, so applications and opportunities, I can see some implications and applications for um, work in both dignity and rights. I think the impact is really gonna be in well-being and flourishing at the individual and collective level. And I wanted to talk and seed some ideas about collaboration. So in terms of um, the, inf the existing structure for universal human rights um, in international law, it's clear based on existing agreements that there's a need um, really to bolster the whole, the intellectual infrastructure that is supporting the entire enterprise. I think that what we've articulated here is a first step towards identifying what human dignity entails and um, how that transcends the things that can divide us. I also feel that personally, that a lot of this, this whole body of work is really pitched at the level of nation states. And so as individual people, it's really hard to engage with it because you think, well, you know, clearly that's relevant to you know, sanctions and times of war and things like that. But as an individual, how do you enact that? I think that this framework of thinking about universal rights and responsibilities 
as these five domains with some special protections on board that respect plasticity really allow you to enter that enterprise as an individual person in how you're interacting with people in your everyday life, you know, in your home, in your workplace, in your community. So I think for me, one of the exciting things about this is that I feel like what we've done here in this entire um, field, if it becomes a field, will do is, is we're actually looking, we actually have some information about what human dignity entails, right? Like, it seems like that is a black box that no one could ever understand. But what we found in these international documents is really a repository of wisdom. And that repository of wisdom about what human dignity is has a specific structure. That structure entails five domains and a modifier. And I think that we've really taken the first step at sort of reverse engineering from this body of collective, almost crowdsourced wisdom about what are universal human rights. It tells us something about what inherent human dignity entails. And that's important for us as individuals, you know, not only for ourselves, but also for how we parent, how we interact with, you know, colleagues, students, the people in our community, strangers. I mean, I, I think it's actually quite profound. Um, the second thing is that, you know, neuroscience is not the only repository of wisdom that's relevant to this question. Um, so I wanna make it very, very clear that what we have here is just um, a very narrow question of what is the structure of, exist, of rights in existing agreements and how, does that, how is that supported by what we know in human brain science? Um, I think that there's a lot and it's clear that we have rich traditions that are relevant to these issues and that they span multiple um, fields of scholarship. So I think that the impact will be really on flourishing. I think across different cultures, uh, those components are gonna probably depend a little bit about on which culture you're in. I think in America, you know, the agency dimension is clearly paramount. In other cultures, the unconditional belonging and connection amongst people in the communities, especially in indigenous cultures, is going to probably be paramount. Um, but we can really start to think about ways in which agency and unconditionality can be used to leverage, you know, support for well-being and also for changing behavior of individuals in the society. I think too, in American culture in particular, you know, a lot of these domains are given a bit of short shrift. So I think it gives us um, some leverage on um, changing for the better. I also feel, at least in my own personal experience in talking with people about these issues, that you know, this sort of the five domains of universal rights and dignity really gives you some new tools for thinking about justice, about the way we interact and support one another. And also it gives us a brand new way to talk about um, human rights issues. So I was talking with a group, um, the mindfulness group at Brown and one of the postdocs actually came up with this amazing phrase and she said, you know, that these things are violations to dignity. And I thought that is profound that actions can be violations to dignity. It's not just, that's a human rights violation. It's a violation to dignity. And in this framework, you can actually be quite specific about what those violations would entail. So they can be, it's a violation to agency or it's a violation to uniqueness. It's a violation to unconditionality. So you can get some specificity and objectivity as to why actions need to be redressed. So I think it gives us some new tools and language for supporting both individual and collective well-being, but also for any social justice um, initiatives and interventions that we may have. So, so regarding potential future directions. So, you know, I think we're at the beginning. I think it's a conversation. I also think it's it can and will be a very big tent 
And I think that because these issues are so, it's really first principles. And I think as a result, I think that um, even though a lot of the work is by, necess by necessity going to be interdisciplinary, I feel like a lot of these first principles are actually sort of pre-disciplinary. It's, it's like before the disciplines. It's shared underneath each of our disciplines. And so I think we have ways to talk across domains of scholarship, um, both you know, in the academy, but outside of the, the academy, in communities and in governments that we can really connect across, across our sort of local culture of, um, of our local sort of academic community and silo to really address some of these commonalities. I want to just give a, a really quick, I realize I didn't get to my lab. Um, Meg Gonsalves was absolutely critical. She was my co-author on this paper. She took some of the really hard work in discrimination, poverty, and maltreatment and um, really helped flesh out those areas. And then I have a senior who's defending her honors thesis in one month, um, uh, a new member of the lab who's an MD, PhD candidate in neuroscience, Chloe, who has recently told me that our um, immunity wanes after approximately three years to almost all bugs, which explains the rough cold I had two weeks ago. Um, and then the newest member of the lab, Rosa, who um, is coming to me from the Watson Institute and is actually in political science, and she's particularly interested in dignity and neuroscience, so she's going to help get this community off the ground. Um, and then also a little funding with um, a big shout out to the British Academy and the University of Cambridge, which allowed me to be there um, to even initiate these, these ideas. So. All right, well, thank you so much. And I, I really appreciate being a part of this community, especially in person, but also asynchronously. So um, also I'm very easy to find. It's my email is basically my name, Tara underscore white at Brown. So I'm super easy to find. And I, you know, I'm trying to build out this work in any way that's useful um, to all the disciplines that are, are, you know, potentially relevant. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm here and open. So look forward to the next steps. All right, thank you. I wanted to open it up and I'm, we have a little bit of time just to talk about the ways in which you are connecting with these ideas, um, things that you think we could do, and also how we could use these domains um, to address issues we care about in mind, brain, and culture. So. Sure. So, first of all, I love both questions, the observation and the question. So, you know, I'm certainly not an expert in international law. Uh, I'm coming to this as a psychologist and as a neuroscientist. So um, that said, I have talked with colleagues in international law and they have indicated to me that there is actually fairly widespread involvement, not just of Western nations in the um, sort of crowdsourcing of the wisdom that went into these documents, but there was involvement of the global South of non-Western nations and also of indigenous communities. So I, I have it on um, good faith from colleagues in international law that actually the assertion that this is a purely Western project is actually not true. Also, while this particular you know, paper as a starting point just took these um, source documents produced by the United Nations since 1948 as the, the place to begin, the ideas articulated in those documents actually predate those documents and it were not created wholesale in 1948. So they're drawing on deep cultural, religious, and philosophical um, you know, beliefs and traditions that informed the um, product in these rights and treaties. So I would say that it wasn't this, it, arbitrary decisions of a small group of Westerners at a specific period in, of time, but it, it does um, reflect a longstanding um, source of wisdom that has come to us over time from multiple um, cultures. Regarding the um, 
The second observation, I mean, there are bad actors and that's why this inquiry I think is important. Yes, so we were actually extremely careful to only cite human work in this paper. And we're talking specifically about inherent human dignity, but you can very easily imagine that um, other species have their own forms of dignity that exist outside of their relationship with us. So one could easily imagine that we could have um, universal grade eight brights <laughs> um, that uh, reflect the ecology and the needs of that species. So this is you know, universal human rights, but I think it does definitely open the door for a conversation about what do rights of other species entail and how can we um, respect those. So I think, I think it will be a dialogue going forward. Um, for me, it's really been very interesting because I've just learned a tremendous amount about, you know, cultural differences in belief systems, um, and especially indigenous cultures where, um, the moral, like individual people are not necessarily the only moral subjects. And in that it's not really about the individual, but it's about the relationship between the individual and their community and the relationship between the community and other animate and inanimate elements in the world. So that includes both other species, other animals, but also inanimate um, aspects of our world, like the land the air, the water. So that's a really enriched um, approach. And it's clearly out, you know, would not captured by this sort of repository of wisdom that we have here in the universal rights declarations. But I think it's it, this, thinking about it in this way, I feel for me at least has brought a really complex and broad reaching set of documents that are hard to wrangle into a format where you're like, okay, if there are actually five domains in a modifier in terms of universal human rights, how does that help um, have a conversation about what other rights there are and what our responsibilities are, not only to each other, but also the natural world? All right, that was a long answer to a short question. <laughs> so um, I, I really think the point about, uh, a structural framework for the language that we use when we're talking about human rights is, is very important. So to, I don't know if this is nitpicky on the language itself, but yeah. looking at the freedom from wants, can you maybe talk a little more about why you chose that specific terminology? Because a lot of it is based around um, not suffering from absolute poverty and needing basic needs like hunger and thirst or something along those lines. So, so what made you stick to freedom from wants specifically, if we're gonna be using that language in our future sure, discussions. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I'm open to changing the language here. I, this is sort of a first pass for me. Um, freedom from want is actually a terminology that crops up in the, the human rights community um, and also in international law documents and some of the foundational sort of thought leaders like that led to this body of work. So. I'm sort of piggybacking on existing language um, and want being not defined as I want it, <laughs> but want as being extreme destitution and poverty, um, conditions that are not conducive to human health and flourishing. Um, and I think that's where, um, that's why I've included discrimination in, under that category because those are, you know, constraints and decisions by others that reduce opportunities that are necessary for flourishing. So I, I felt like it was a natural place for discrimination and poverty to live under that umbrella, but we can continue that conversation. Yeah, it might be a bit of a blunt instrument. <laughs> Back in the chair. <laughs> Thank you, that was a really great talk and just set off all kinds of thoughts. Um, but uh, so, uh, so I was thinking about um, what are the threats to dignity, situational threats, and from my own work on aging and the life of mm -hmm. uh, that I have, that's where my mind went, which is universal. So, uh, or at least hope, right. to be to age. 
best case scenario is that it will be a universal, right? <laughs> yes. yes. Um, and, and so um, I was thinking about the work of Paul optimization with it. It would tie into this movie. Really? Um, I will look into that. He has a famous address to the American Psychological Please. I would love that. Um, he, so I, am I not loud enough? Okay. <laughs> uh, Paul and Margaret Baltus were the directors of the Berlin Aging Study, and they okay. followed um, older people for long periods of time. Um, and he was interested in the way people select activities as they get older and mm -hmm. they begin to lose capacities in various areas of human endeavor. The, um, they select, select, select areas to emphasize and they optimize by practicing right. and then they compensate by substituting. Mm -hmm. That's a very short version of it. He has some wonderful examples in the speech, but um, he also talks about the fourth age and the the inevitable, I mean, inevitable if we are living long lives, right. um, period of the loss of, of dignity and of the loss of these capacities. So there's ways of adapting, but then eventually there is a fourth age of frailty and mm -hmm. dependency. And he says the only thing that can save us, and I don't know if he uses the word dignity, I can't yeah. remember, but the only way we can save our human self is by culture. Culture has to step in to provide mm -hmm. the dignity and sense of self that is being lost. And so I, if you, I'm not a psychologist, I'm a, I'm a sociologist, but yeah. um, I do think that that's really relevant to this because, because the threats to dignity are, are universal. They're not mm -hmm. situational or, mm -hmm. or they at least are. If we In that life that. stage, they are you know, going to be universe, universal. Yeah. Well, I think that raises a really interesting point that as an individual is losing a sense of agency and of efficacy and ability. And that's impacting probably their own self view, but certainly their ability to act in the world that, you know, other aspects of dignity can come into play. And I think that the unconditional belonging and support that we, that is a part of the human condition, but also something that we owe one another. Um, and I think that, you know, it's beautifully said that that's where culture should step in. And to have a some languaging around that, that it's it's not just that, you know, so and so has lived a, good, a long life and requires my care. It's that they have inherent human dignity. That in, inherent human dignity entails the domain of unconditional belonging and support, and that it respects the dignity of the person, even when their abilities are maybe not what they even themselves would want them to be. Yeah. It also, you know, that is also relevant to, you know, all issues of disability, visible and invisible. So it's, I think it's profoundly, you know, well articulated in the in later life, but also relevant throughout life. You know. Thank you.